We want to welcome everybody to Quincy Fire Ops 101 and thank everybody for coming out and spending their beautiful Saturday morning with us. It's appreciated. <coughs> Question, what is Fire Ops 101 and where did it come from? It came from the International Association of Firefighters, the IAFF, which is our parent union organization. It was constructed to educate elected officials, decision makers, community leaders, and the media on what it is that we do as professional firefighters on a daily basis simply by doing it yourself. And it's that easy. It's that easy. Um, at times, we as a local or department will address the city and or state on issues, whether it be equipment, training, certain legislation, whatever it is, this is also guided to give you a better understanding during that process, okay? So three things that we're gonna do today. Learn by learning, have fun, everybody will have fun. Most important thing that trumps everything, everybody's gonna stay safe. Uh, my job's the easy job. Uh, Lieutenant Palazzo did all the introductions. I don't know if I could go around the room and hit everybody's name, so <laughs> I have to thank the lieutenant. Um, and I certainly uh, want to thank uh, Quincy Cable. want to thank every firefighter that's in the room here today. Uh, what we have is really a cross-section of recruit training, so you're going to get a little bit of everything. Uh, we do it in about eight weeks. We're going to do it in a couple of hours. What I tell all the recruits when they go through it, and particularly if they go through a burn building, building, is these are props. They're like theatrical props. We try to add a little bit of stress with our recruits. In, uh, in a burn building, you don't have to do that. Uh, the fire, actually, and the heat is, is very real. We're, we're not going to uh, create any fires here today. I don't think Mr. Quirk would be too happy uh, for, with us if we did that. And uh, I want to thank Mr. Quirk before we get too far along. Everything that we have here, uh, this space, it's uh, utilized by other departments throughout the South Shore. Even a few from the North Shore come down here and train. Uh, we'd be hard pressed to find a facility like this uh, anywhere in the city. So uh, out of the generosity of Mr. Quirk, we, we were able to do this. So it's a cross section of, of, of what a recruit actually does. And um, we do add a little bit of stress. We time them and we, and we grade them. We're not going to do that with you folks here today. Uh, but uh, I would just tell you to relax and to go slow and, and really feel what it is that a firefighter does. Uh, somebody will ask me occasionally on a particular movie or a, a show like uh, Chicago Fire, is that what it's really like to be a firefighter? The answer is yes, it is. It is, but it doesn't happen in 90 minutes. It might happen over 30 years. But you'll see every part of that. You'll go to those runs. You'll experience uh, that, uh, that heat and that trauma and uh, all of those things. So um, we'll recreate as much as we can here today. You just want to go slow and, uh, and take your time. But um, I appreciate you doing it. It'll give you a better understanding of what it's like to be a firefighter in the city of Quincy. Certainly, uh, it, for my money, it's the best fire, fire department in the country. I'm very proud of all of these gentlemen. And uh, I just thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoy it. I'm Rich Bryan. I'm captain. My office is here. I have a, a few different duties, HAZMAT being one of them, working with emergency management, um, taking care of the grants for the city, and um, being a liaison to uh, URC, which is our homeland security, um, the, the region that we're in, the Metro Boston Homeland Security region, which just affords us a lot of the uh, equipment that we get and um, opportunities for training. This is kind of a, a two-hour snippet of an eight to ten week program. A lot of times our recruits don't know where fire hoses are in the city of Quincy. So that's part of our education with them. They don't know what areas of the city those fire hoses cover, what equipment is at those fire hoses, meaning the pieces of apparatus. So we wanted to cover that with you. Also the Quincy fire, we like to call now that the um, the verbiage is changing over time where they always were the fire department or the fire rescue department. Now the all hazard um, kind of a, a, a title's been given to that because of all the things that we do and we get involved with from, and we'll go over a list of them, from fires to natural disasters to medical emergencies. And then we'll go through the Fire Ops 101 evolution so you have um, a basic understanding of what you're going to be doing 
uh, for the next couple hours. <clears throat> and again, we can't stress the safety part of it enough. Lieutenant Wirtz will give you a quick little safety brief. He blows his whistle and yells stop, or if anybody does, then that's, that's stop. So the central station, 40 Quincy Ave, you can see the pieces of apparatus we have there. We put their ages up and basically the, who makes them. You have an engine ladder, one rescue one, car two, which is the incident commander, runs out of there. And those pieces respond to those wards that you see. One, two, three, four, and five. Engine one and ladder one are, are mutual aid pieces, meaning they go out of the city to other communities when their incidents become a little bit bigger than they can handle, either for coverage or going to the incident to help them out. The Atlantic Station, 311 Hancock Street. Engine two and our brand new piece, 2014 ladder truck. We appreciate you guys voting for that and pushing it through. Uh, the men's person, the guys that are on it, greatly appreciate it. The wards it serves and also ladder five is a mutual aid piece. I think basically just goes to Boston when they have a fifth alarm or greater. <clears throat> Quincy Point, Washington Street and engine three serves wards one and two, also a mutual aid piece, mostly to, uh, to Weymouth when they have an incident. Wollaston, engine four, ladder two, the wards it serves. Ladder two responds to every fire in the city. It's kind of basically in the, the center of the city if there's a, a fire in Hausnack, a fire in Squanum, ladder two is going to it, along with other trucks too. West Quincy Station, engine five, the truck next to it, which I didn't put on the on a PowerPoint here is a um, SSU, basically it's kind of like a brush truck. It has a very small tank on it, pump that we can take into the Blue Hills uh, for, for fires. Engine five is also a mutual aid piece. Engine six, how's neck? Squanum in our Germantown station. Uh, some of our spare apparatus, basically we take, we get frontline apparatus, we get new pieces of apparatus, we can turn those around in spares. They have a little bit longer life as a spare because they're not out running every day. And they still hold up well, thanks to our mechanics, do a fantastic job. Uh, the work they do with these trucks, keeping them going is, is sometimes amazing. So our QFD uh, duties or responses, like I said, are all hazard. It's a term we like to use. Nine to 10,000 runs annually, um, dependent, just depends on the year. So we have all categories of fires, from structure fires to outside fires, vehicles in between, medical incidents, hazardous materials, incidents, those are our big ones that are listed there, CO calls, that season will start up soon. Flammable combustible liquid spills. Um, we have two huge tank farms within the city that, you know, th thankfully, and I, um, we don't have a lot of issues with them, but the potential is, certainly there. Uh, technical rescues over the last year we trained um, the headquarters, all the headquarters personnel pretty much in high angle can find space in trench rescue. Those are like the three big ones when it comes to doing technical rescues and we've also been able to purchase a lot of equipment that goes along with performing those rescues as well and keep up with some ongoing training as well. We're also fortunate to train engine three, engine five, and ladder five um, on some high angle training as well um, in anticipation of a new bridge here being built and the old one being dismantled. So vehicle extrications, um, you'll get to partake in that. These are just some of our other calls, alarm activations, obviously natural disasters. We're out there anywhere from getting people out of their houses to getting trees out of the road. A lot of wire down calls happen with those. Uh, on a daily basis, the companies that are out there performing fire prevention and code enforcement uh, duties just by the sake of being out there in the community and seeing things that aren't right, either pushing it up to fire prevention or educating the public. Ice and water rescues are obviously surrounded, pretty much surrounded by water here in Quincy. And uh, electrical emergencies as well. So Fire Ops 101, the reason you're here. So we're gonna do an engine company operation which will be um, advancing an uncharged hose line from the engine out here up these stairs to our apartment, which you're in now. 
Um, the door, that blue door, which is a forcible entry prop, will be forced open. You'll then call for the water. The line will be charged, and then you'll have to move the line over to the window and play the water out the window. Uh, we're trying to get across to you how much it takes the, you know, the teamwork that's involved and the amount of labor that's involved to move a line. And you'll see a big difference between the uncharged line and then when we put water in it, what the difference is. Um, and then when you put the water out the window to feel the, the reaction of all that water leaving that hose. And the ladder company <coughs> operations will have another crew outside that will get split up. Um, we're going to set the aerial up to the side of this window. It'll be at a very low angle, something that you could walk on. So if you'd like to, you can walk up the aerial to the window. You would obviously be like a mock, taking the window out to ventilate. <clears throat> there will also be a crew that will force that um, blue door for the engine crew when it gets up here. So they'll have to take an axe and a tool we call a halligan and break through that door in order to open it, simulating opening up the door of an apartment for that engine crew to attack the fire. And then we have a couple of ground ladders outside that we can throw. We have an unbelievable prop in the back corner of this. And after you've done going through it, if you all wish to participate, we'll turn the lights on and show you our maze out back. The firefighters don't get to see it because they have to train in it. And once you've seen it once, you get a mental picture and it takes the effect of it away. But for you guys, we'll go through it. It's a pretty easy maze run. You'll go in on a, what we call a right-hand search. So you, you're on your hands and knees. We, in, you'll be in your gear. <clears throat> you basically go along the wall feeling with your right hand until you find the victim. When you find the victim, you'll do a 180 and come out on your left hand basically the same way you went in, but in reverse. And you'll find your way right out. That's how we search rooms in zero visibility. So a, a right-hand search, I can go through an entire room and get back to the door I came in if I stay on that one hand or if I know enough and have been trained to switch halfway through and come out on my other hand. Find the victim, you'll notify command. Someone will be in there. You'll just say, you know, you can make up your own engine from whatever ward you're in. Engine one to command, I found the victim. The command has the message, you'll then make your way out of the, there, leave the, the victim where it is. We have a car out back that we can um, basically vehicle extrication. We'll cut it up, take the doors off, one or two of them or three or four of them, cut the roof, fold the roof back and just show you how we do all of that. And then once we're done with that, we'll fold the roof back over and light it on fire. And we could probably do two burns in that car so you guys can have a chance at uh, doing the fire. And we'll instruct you out there how we do it, how we're trained to do it a certain way and you can do the same thing. So feel a little bit of heat so you can get a little sensation of that and see how quick you can actually put the car out. I appreciate you guys coming. This is a great opportunity for you to learn what we do. My name's Matt Walsh. I'm a lieutenant down Engine 6 in, North, in uh, Howes Neck. I'm from North Quincy, so down in Howes Neck. But I'm just going to give you a brief uh, overview of the SCBA and the mask, okay? This is a whole day class when you're in the training academy. I'm going to condense it into about 10 minutes, all right? So I did put up some pertinent information on the board. SCBA, self-contained breathing apparatus. It's only missing, you know, S scuba is the same thing, just that's underwater. This is SCBA. It's open circuit, which means you're not rebreathing the air. It's just the air that's in the tank. Common question is, is this oxygen? It's not. It's just room air that's been compressed and condensed into a 4,500 PSI tank, okay? Cylinder is about 11 pounds by itself, okay? As I said, it's about 4,500 PSI under pressure inside the tank. The bottles that we have that are in these packs today are 30-minute bottles, okay? They make 60-minute bottles. They make 75-minute bottles for other operations. 30 minutes is the standard. Okay, our rescue truck, our RIT team, which is the rapid intervention team, if there's a firefighter down, we'd send in, would have an hour bottle, okay? That being said, they're not really hour bottles, they're not really 30-minute bottles, okay? Everybody breathes different under stress. No two firefighters are the same, but a good rule of thumb is you have about between 12 and 18 minutes worth of air, okay? After that, there's a few things that happen to, to signal that you need to remove yourself from the environment, okay? And I'll get into that in just, in just a sec. With the pack, the whole unit's about 22 pounds, okay? So you factor in the 22 pounds, 
plus the fire gear, you're looking at 40 or 50 pounds of gear. It's a lot. So you can see how you're not breathing 30 minutes worth of air, okay? You factor in the stress, the heat, what the conditions are, you know, you have to be conscientious. That's why we do two-man teams for something like that, okay? Before I get into the face, the, into the fitting, as all you guys, as some of you have already kind of done, I just want to go over the HUD. The HUD is this regulator. If you look at the regulator, I'm not, we're not going to turn them on now. I'll turn mine on. Underneath this flap here, you have a circle and you have four, LE, uh, four squares. These are LEDs. And these are indicators to the firefighter of how much air you have and how much air you have left, okay? When you first turn these on, you're going to have a, um, a battery check. They're all going to light up, okay? Then it's going to go down to two green. Two green solids mean you have a full tank, okay? Again, 30 minutes, give or take, worth of air. As you start to breathe in, it's going to go down. The third one, it will go down, I'm sorry, the two green is full, then it's going to go down to three quarters, which is a solid green, okay? From there, it's going to go down to either an orange or a yellow color. That's going to flash. That's halfway. And then quarter, it's going to go down to a quickly, a, um, a rapidly flashing red light in addition to a vibra alert. You'll notice the vibra alert, okay? There is a, um, a, a diaphragm inside the regulator that will start to flap against your face. It makes an unmistakable sound. You'll know right away what it is. That means immediately you'll have to leave the environment. Let's just do a quick fitting of the face piece. I don't want to take any more time up. You want to put your chin into the bottom of the face piece, okay? And you want to take the yellow mesh and pull it right over the top of your head. Your wrangler, if the wranglers can help, if anybody needs a hand. And once that on, you want to pull the top two, the temple straps, you want to pull them tight. Okay, temple straps tight. Once you have the temple straps tight, you want to pull the neck straps tight. Okay, pull the neck straps tight. Everybody good? Okay, now once the neck straps are tight, what I want you to do is take the palm of your hand, put it, on the opening of the regulator and breathe in. It should be a nice tight seal. Everybody good? Everybody have a tight seal? You're going to turn the valve on in the back. Your wranglers will help you do this. When you do that, when this first goes on, you're going to hear a beeping that's going to alert the um, personal alert safety system that we have in here. This is a signal to let the outside know or other firefighters know that there's someone down. And it makes a noise every, um, every few seconds to alert that there's movement, okay? So I'm going to turn this on first. That first noise you heard was the vibra alert, okay? Now there's the pass device going on. So the vibra alert, that vibrating you heard, when the red light starts to rapidly flash, that's the vibra alert that's going to go on. You have to leave the uh, area immediately, okay? Uh, safety officer, uh, Captain Wirtz will be around and just raise your hand or whatever and he'll take you out of the environment. <coughs> this is on. Now right there, I just wanted to wait for a sec. That's the pass device starting to go on. You have to be in constant movement with the tank, okay? When you're not moving, the alert will go off. Before, back, before they had these integrated pass devices, these security systems, there was a manual button you had to switch. Some of the guys still wear them on their jackets. Unfortunately, when firefighters got into trouble, they wouldn't hit, have a chance to maybe hit that button to signal that they were in trouble. So they integrated these things, these security systems, into the tank. Good and bad, because a lot of times guys stand around, they start to go off. It can kind of be a false alarm at times. But if you're down, you can't get at your tank, you can't do it manually, this will go off and it'll alert, hopefully, another firefighter who's ever on the line with you, a ladder guy, that you're in trouble, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the tank on, I'm going to put the mask on, I'm going to show you how to go on to air, okay? Then I'm going to take it off. And then from there, we're going to get you guys with your wranglers and start the evolution. So again, you put your mask on, put your chin in the bottom, Pull it over your head. Tighten the temple straps. The neck straps. Make sure you got a good seal. You got a good seal here. You want to take the tank. You want to have the tank facing towards you, okay? Straps outside. And you want to put it on like you're putting on a jacket. So you just take it pull it over, okay? You want to make sure the straps are okay. Take the shoulder straps, just cinch those down, okay? Take the buckle. Good thing I got my corset on today, make sure I can get this to fit. I'm going to put that in. 
We're going to take these two side straps. Sometimes they get tangled. Your wrangler will help you get these. You want to kind of tighten those up. Then from here, as you can see, I'll just show you. You can see the two green LEDs. Can you see those? Okay, so I got a full tank of air. You want to take this. You want to put it at 6 o'clock, the purge valve. This is the purge valve. Again, guys, I know I'm going fast. I'm trying to get it all in here, okay? You want to take it, turn it, and now you're on air, okay? The tank is positive pressure, so there's always air flowing out. That way, nothing, no, uh, no um, dangerous atmospheres can come in. If I pull my mask off, you can hear the air. Okay? Always blowing air into your face, okay? So, take it off. There's a button up here you can press down that'll stop the air. Again, the Wranglers will help you through all of that, okay? I know it's a lot of information in a short amount of time, but uh, again, I want you guys to get out there and have some fun. So this is a rescue truck. For those of you who don't know, Rescue One. Rescue One doesn't carry any ladders of water. It's a rolling tube box. Okay? The Rescue One's chief duty is to rescue. Okay? Now, in the scenario we ran on the other side there with the engine and ladder, if the rescue was in service, the engine would fall in line. I mean, the rescue. What would happen is the engine would be off first, running their lines like we did, getting water going. Ladder would be ventilating, forcible entry, and the rescue would be rescuing people, correct? Right? So we'd be right on the heels of the engine company, and we'd be doing a search. Unfortunately, with the rescue out of service 70% of the time, the other companies have to pick up that duty, okay? So you see how tough it is getting in and out of the building. Now imagine having to split two people off of those companies to do a search. Difficult, right? But when we have a three or four man rescue team in that scenario, life safety is number one. We're searching. So, that being said, rescue entails a lot of different, other than house fires and everything else, we do a lot of car accidents. Search and rescue collapses. Anything that the city requires us to rescue people. Pretty simple. So what we laid out here is tools for car extrication. The scenario we're going to run now is a car accident with people trapped. The rescue would be the first off. The chief truck in line in an accident. The first truck needs to be the closest because the, the tools that we need need to go to the people that are trapped. Engine would be the second. Pull their line off, get the water ready in case the car catches on fire, obviously. So, what we're going to do now is we're going to cut this car up. We're going to simulate that there's a per person trapped. All the tools that I laid out here are what we're going to use. Okay, we have jaws on the truck. If you want to turn around, you see those, those big tools there with the uh, orange and green lines. That's hydraulically filled lines that are going to run those tools. Okay, you're going to be amazed at how those things tear apart a car. Also, over here, what we have is a scenario where a car on it is on its side, obviously. This is what we find more often than not. Very rarely do we have a car accident that looks like this, okay? So what we have is a Paratech strut stabilization system right there. There's one on the other side. What that does is it's three points of contact and it stabilizes the car in place. Obviously when we get off on a car accident and there's somebody in that van, we're not going to push the van over and say, okay, now we can get them out. You have to get the person out the way we find them. So we need to stabilize. So that's why that's there. You can step up, put your hands on the tools.
know, I think this was a really great opportunity and a big thank you to Local 792 and the Quincy Firefighters and Chief Barron for inviting the elected officials here today. You know, I've spent some time in a cruiser, I've spent some time sitting at dispatch. You know, and, um, I haven't had the opportunity, aside from visiting the fire station, to have that level of interaction. I got to spend time today with Engine 6 Lieutenant Walsh, and he was terrific. He was, he was my wrangler, and uh, was my wingman, kind of guiding me through this and educating me about the ins and outs of the job at Quincy Fire. So, uh, the maze, we were out in a maze up on a ladder outside the building, breaking through a door. I mean, they really uh, cut it using the uh, cutting tools on the vehicles, I and mean, they really gave us a lot of uh, insight as to the different things that they do in their res in their daily responses. We were actually in the footsteps of a firefighter, and in my opinion, it, it, it really gives us more of a perspective as to the dangers and qualifications and training that our department here in the city of Quincy has to go through in order to uh, mitigate and uh, be rid of a fire. So. It's, it's a great hands-on experience. It's a heck of a workout for sure. And um, we're very fortunate in the city to have such a qualified fire department like we do with uh, you know, the Quincy firemen. This is a really eye-opening experience uh, to be here with some of my colleagues in government and um, working with the Quincy Fire Department. And I'm so grateful for having that opportunity and grateful uh, for, for them even more appreciative of, of what they do every day. You know, there's an old expression, when you hear, you forget, when you see, you remember, when you do, you understand, um, that really has taken on meaning for me today, um, seeing how they, they do all of the different um, uh, things that they do in terms of whether it's fire suppression, uh, extrication from uh, vehicles at a uh, motor vehicle crash, uh, search and rescue, um, just, the, just the sheer weight of the equipment um, that has to be carried, and th thinking in terms of uh, the the obstacles that they face, uh, the weather that they do this in, whether it's a 90 degree day in the, in the summertime or below zero in the winter with, you know, with water that uh, freezes up and, uh, and creates hazards for them. So uh, this is a, a tremendous opportunity uh, for all of us today and I'm just grateful for it. And I, like I said, more of an appreciation of uh, what they do and what they need to, to do their job, the equipment and uh, the manpower um, that, and uh, you know, none of, n nothing that's technologically that's available today can replace manpower. Um, that's really the bottom line. And uh, so, very grateful for the QFD uh, for what they do every day. This was probably one of the most um, uh, extraordinary experiences, I would say, in my council career, where you actually have the opportunity to, to spend a day in the life of someone that works in municipal government and public safety that does it as a career. And uh, the simulations that we did, whether it were on the ladder truck or in the engine truck or, you know, operating the hose at, at intense pressure or making our way through a dark maze to try and find and rescue somebody up in their bed. Um, you know, just an extraordinary sense of the physical challenge, the equipment needs, and uh, the training, 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 training that this, the staff needs to do. And I'm, uh, I'm humbled and I'm grateful to the Quincy Fire Department, uh, you know, Deputy Chief Ryan, and uh, all the folks here that made the day possible uh, to show us what they do every day, extraordinary. And uh, I now have a better sense when requests for firefighter apparatus or firefighter equipment or training come before the city council because I lived it. Uh, today we lived it and uh, it was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and I really encourage anybody that has the opportunity to come in and see what they do and, and walk in their shoes to take that opportunity. Left. 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 Doorway. 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 Doorway.